Welcome to another program of the public interest. I am Malika Ramsey, and welcome Mr. David Granger, leader of the opposition. Thank you. All right. Now, the findings of the Linden Commission of Inquiry were recently revealed to the public, and persons would have had their say already regarding those findings and the summary. Today we hear from the leader of the opposition, and of course the leader of the People's National Congress Reform, uh, regarding his take on those findings and whether he is satisfied or not as it relates to the Linden Commission of Inquiry. First off, sir, some statements of yours have already found uh, their way into the public domain. It, it's, it, it is alleged that you are not satisfied with the findings, or I should say with the summary, the report of the Linden Commission of Inquiry. Assuming that those reports are accurate, what is it that really went wrong with the Linden Commission of Inquiry? It's easy to criticize something once it has passed, you know, and the, the people always say, you know, um, hindsight, you know, you have 20 20 vision, but several things could be seen to have gone wrong. To start with, the issues that resulted in the shooting or in, resulted in the protests in Linden between April and July 2012 were complex. They were not just political, um, they certainly had social, economic, and security implications. Um, I think the first thing that went wrong was that all five commissioners were attorneys. Five of them were former judges, and one was one is an attorney at law. So we did not really have anybody on the commission who brought a, a sort of social or even humanitarian uh, talent to the commission. All of them were lawyers. Maybe they were interested in in um, in black and white evidence, you know. But uh, I think the issues on the ground were uh, more subtle and they, they required a different um, set of talents. So I think having five, four judges and one um, attorney at law uh, was not a, a really balanced commission to start with. Secondly, as far as the evidence was concerned, um, the commission didn't seem to connect the dots I mean, they, 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 we were told that there were over 800 protesters. The police anticipated there was going to be a big demonstration. Permission was applied for. And yet the police deployed only a half unit. And half of the half unit was inadequately trained. Uh, this meant, you know, I suppose in, in law enforcement terms, that the the fewer people you deployed, the greater threat they would have been of their being overrun if the crowd was really disorderly. In this case, the crowd was not disorderly. Uh, what also happened um, is that the police engaged the crowd at 11 o'clock um, that day, and they came back nearly seven hours later. Well, that's not a way to disperse a crowd if it's unruly or disorderly. So the the commission did not connect the dots. They did not see that the police deployment itself being inadequate from the start would have caused problems. Um, although they found that the uh, police were responsible for the killings, uh, they seemed unable to determine where the ammunition came from. Obviously, it had to come from the police um, because that is their own determination. And they seemed unable to determine exactly who fired. Um, so although they were satisfied that the police did the shootings, uh, they did not probe deeply enough to determine who actually um, squeezed the trigger that killed, uh, or the triggers that killed those three persons. I think the biggest problem that went, uh, that affects the Lindeners themselves, and you can see what went wrong, was that um, the compensation was absolutely um, laughable. Uh, we have a situation in which um, persons lost their lives, but when you listen to the arguments advanced by the commission itself, you want to know which planet they're on, because it, it, is, it was quite inhumane. I mean, they're arguing, for example, um, 
one person's mother was getting $30,000 a month as a security guard, and therefore um, they cut down the, the amount of money given um, to his estate. You guys dead, of course, he can't collect anything. And because his mother's working $30,000, if the commissioners must know that um, $30,000 in Guyana is no salary to speak about. Um, so there were lots of errors in the compensation. Now there is something called the Ogden Tables in United Kingdom. And this came about by um, the work, or through the work of uh, a British barrister called Sir Michael Ogden. And this is over 30 years ago. Mainly because he was dissatisfied with the judiciary's allocation of, of um, compensation to victims of crime. So there has been in existence in the Western world something called the Ogden Tables, which could be used as a guideline. You don't have to guess. Um, you have a guideline as to what compensation should be paid to persons who sustain injuries or persons who were killed, um, especially in this case killed by the state. Um, apparently those guidelines were not used and when you read the excuses or the explanations, the rationalization, the justification given by the uh, Commission of Inquiry, you, you really wonder whether these people have a heart at all. They, 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 the awards were heartless. Sir, several things came out, Some several very interesting things um, just came out uh, in your response. The first thing I want to deal with though is the police and the fact that no police officer was named or is uh, held responsible for what really happened. How important it is, you know, or would have been for a police officer to be named? Because you may be accused, of, of course yourself and the entire opposition may be accused of um, trying to create a problem with where there is none because it can be said that, look, the opposition uh, along with members of civil society wanted a commission of inquiry, they've got the commission of inquiry, the summary, the report is out there, but now it's as if, it's as if you're picking for something else. Uh, let's talk about the naming of a policeman or policemen who would have been responsible. Well, in response to your statement, all inquiries are not the same. In my in my view, this particular inquiry was weak, <laughs> um, and I have no, um, no regrets in saying that. It was weak because they did not connect the dots, they did not ask the right questions. And I am confident that um, they could have determined who actually squeezed the trigger and where the ammunition came from. No, they themselves listened to evidence that indicated that the um, the ammunition that killed the uh, three men was not officially held by the Guyana police force. But they are aware that samples of that ammunition were actually shown to one of the witnesses. All it meant is that people use unauthorized ammunition. In fact, in one case, one of the members of the police detachment was seen loading his um, weapon uh, even though he should have gone onto the scene with a weapon loaded. So I am not satisfied that um, the, the inquiry is a, a well-conducted one. And this is a matter of murder. This is not a matter of a traffic accident. This is not a matter of an unlawful arrest. This is a matter of three deaths. And um, I am not interested in a witch hunt. But if justice is to be done, we must determine who did the shooting in that squad. And it is not as though they had a, a thousand policemen. The number of policemen who could have fired is limited. And the Commission of Inquiry had a, an obligation to the people of Guyana to probe more deeply. Now, if this is not done, we will see recurrence of police brutality and police misconduct over and over again. I want to call the attention of the public to the fact that since December 2011, when some protesters were shot, peaceful protesters were shot in Brickdam, the police turned out in greater numbers to deal with a peaceful protest and actually shot rubber pellets into the flesh of some of the protesters. Now they have 800 people. They, 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 they send 16 policemen. 
you know, in December 2011, they, they fired um, pellets into people's flesh. The same mistake was made several years ago in 2001 in Buxton Friendship. In July um, 2012, they make the same mistake again. Unless the Commission of Inquiry draws the line and tells the government of Ghana not to cross this line, that your policemen are behaving in an unlawful manner, it is not going to stop. So we cannot accept the report of this Commission of Inquiry because it seems to give the police um, license. It, it, they, they mention exoneration. How can you exonerate a minister who has been in charge of public security for over six years? We've had the worst massacres, Bartica and Lusignan. We've had a rising crime rate. Already the murder rate for 2013, the first two months of 2013, is higher than the murder rate for the first two months of 2012. We have a situation in which um, we have not been seeing an improvement in the performance of the Ghana police force. This is the time. This commission of inquiry must accept responsibility for telling the government, telling the Ministry of Home Affairs, telling the People's Progressive Party uh, Civic Administration that the Guyanese public is not satisfied with the way public security is being managed. I want to come to uh, Mr. Rowe. He's um, what everyone is calling his exoneration. But before I do that, um, my question, sir, is do you believe that the commissioners they, or the, the entire body took orders um, from government? Or, or, or do you believe that government had any influence at all on the work of the, the commission? Well, no evidence has been led to that effect. And um, I do not have private evidence of my own. One attorney during the during the process of the commission was was uh, uh, trying to lead in that direction, but there's no evidence. My evidence is drawn from the fact, uh, or drawn from the doctrine of ministerial responsibility. The fact that uh, this particular minister was in that position for over six years. Um, the fact that. Um, there have been serious abuses by the Guyana police force over the years, and those abuses have not stopped. So my, my um, uh, approach is that there is um, the need to apply the doctrine of ministerial responsibility, and this has not happened, even though you cannot, as they say, you know, find the, the, the sort of smoking gun. He was not on the ground, but nowadays people don't have to be on the ground. You use phones, you use radio. I'm not saying that he actually gave an instruction, but over a period of time, he has to accept responsibility for the misbehavior of the Ghana police force. Who else will accept responsibility? He is the spokesman in the National Assembly for the public security sector, and he must accept responsibility. Did this investigation, the inquiry at any time at all, or even now that um, the work has been completed, did it at any time seem to you to be aimed at proving the minister's innocence instead of acquiring justice for the people who would have um, lost uh, uh, human resources, who would have uh, suffered the, the loss of their relatives and friends? Well, I don't think that the uh, commission of inquiry had um, necessarily to prove the minister's um, blameworthiness. Um, in fact, throughout the report of the commission, they didn't seem to address their minds to the question of the doctrine of ministerial responsibility. Um, but that is not a major concern of mine. The fact is that three human beings were killed, and the commission should have determined more precisely who did the killing. And um, in the second instance, um, they should have provided proper uh, compensation to the families. And third, they should make recommendations um, to ensure that there's no recurrence. I don't think that um, in those three matters that they have acquitted themselves properly. Earlier you spoke about uh, five judges and I think one attorney. It was um, four judges and four, one attorney. Sorry, four judges and one attorney. And of course, you also noted, you pointed to the fact that first, no one with um, probably the experience of human nature there, the full experience of human nature to deal with, with, with such an inquiry, 
where did it go wrong in terms of choosing who sits on the commission? And, and you know, uh, it, this is probably going back to things that would have been said months ago, but was APN, you or yourself, at any time involved in who sits on the commission? The actual composition of the commission was the result of a tripartite participation, you can say. Um, representatives of the PPPC, APNU, and uh, AFC were involved in making nominations. Um, I don't know if some people who were nominated uh, declined to serve, but the commission was a compromise. Uh, from the outset, I think one of those uh, three parties um, was against uh, nominating local persons and insisted on foreign participation. Uh, but I don't want to uh, try to second guess the motives for the actual selection. Um, but I think that in, on, in retrospect, it would have been better to have uh, persons with different talents. To bring five persons from the same um, intellectual uh, tradition, I think, uh, was, a, was an error in the sense that uh, there was no place for persons who might have been trained in sociology or other disciplines. So you believe with uh, someone trained in other disciplines sitting, um, we may have gotten a different result or different results? I think so, yes. I think so, yes. I mean, I think you, the chairman uh, was probably the best possible chairman could have been uh, a judge, a person with um, that sort of experience. But the other members of the panel, the other members of the commission, could have come from different sources. Um, for example, I would feel that uh, someone who was uh, grounded in the Guyanese society um, would have understood. Um, for example, again, if I can refer to the fact that uh, the commission spoke of uh, 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 the parent of one of the deceased as earning $30,000 a month as a security guard. Um, therefore, you know, um, the boy didn't deserve more uh, compensation because I don't know if they got some strange, uh, you know, information that thirty thousand dollars could run a family, but things like that, you know, mistakes like that uh, were made. Um, there were only um, three foreigners, but there were two uh, Guyanese on the panel, and I feel that um, they could have brought their knowledge of the Guyana economic situation to bear, but it seems that that didn't happen. Have you been able to get any feedback? If not, because we know you're a very busy man, if not meet with the families of uh, the persons who would have died, if not meet with them, but uh, since the release of this report, have you been able to get any feedback on how it is that they really feel about what they're getting or what they're not getting? Well, I met with the victims. I, I actually was in Linden on the night of the 18th. So I met with about 18 persons in hospital on the very night of the shooting. Um, so I'm familiar with um, the injuries um, that they sustained. I actually saw the three bodies even before they had grown cold. I, I actually held them. Um, I visited uh, victims in the hospital. Uh, and last Christmas, I visited the homes and we presented hampers to the family. So I am broadly familiar with the families and the conditions under which they live, but I have not spoken with them after the award has been given on the 28th of February. Um, I can only judge from the feedback that was printed in the newspaper that um, I am dissatisfied and I am not a victim. You know, and I, I'm, I, the information is that all of the families are, are grossly dissatisfied. It is laughable. Like, nobody could be satisfied with them, um, with the awards. Where do we go from here? When I say we, I mean our citizens, especially opposition and uh, yourself and APN. What what can the public expect from you? I mean, you, it's already been stated that you're not satisfied. Is there anything that can be possibly done now to somehow correct this? We have started the process, um, and the process has been going on since the 19th of July, 2012 that something is very seriously wrong with the way the public security is being managed. There are really too many errors, and I think APNU's greatest contribution would be to continue to work inside and outside of the National Assembly to bring about a change in the uh, public security sector, and we have 
passed a motion in no confidence in Clement Rohi, and it is quite clear with each passing day, with the incidents of Marudi, with the incidents of uh, the rise in the murder rate, that he is not the best person to remain in that position. So where do we go from here? Yes, we, we have chosen a path several months ago, and we remain committed to the removal of the minister because he's part of the problem. And we need a more efficient minister who can run the public security sector more competently. Secondly, um, we need to call for an increase in the compensation um, that is paid to the uh, dependents of the, of the three victims and also the persons who were injured. I know in particular one person has already spent more than the award that she has been given because she has had to get specialized treatment. I visited people in the hospital who cannot eat solid because bullets were lodged in their jaws or other parts of their body. We have to continue to work for justice for these people. These were innocent people enjoying their fundamental rights. These were not criminals. These were not behaving in a disorderly manner. And um, it's very disappointing that the Commission of Inquiry could have concluded that these people were behaving in a lawful manner and that they were, their lives were unlawfully taken away from them and could give such a pittance. I want to go back a bit to what really led to the Commission of Inquiry and as it related to protest action because it began with that or, or that was the second event that led to the Commission of Inquiry. And I can also link it to what would have recently happened in Marudi area whereby persons were uh, most of us saw the video footage where persons were brutalized in Marudi for uh, protesting. What does this say? Because in Guyana, the norm is if you're not satisfied, you do a peaceful protest with the placards and, and the whole works. What does this really say to persons who may be dissatisfied with a particular service or a particular minister or even a particular opposition member? Well, it's, it's, it's a wrong signal because as long as persons are going about their business in a lawful manner. Um, their behavior is guaranteed under the Constitution. It is not unconstitutional, it is not unlawful to protest peacefully against um, something that, uh, that is wrong, especially if they, they are victims of um, uh, some transgression by the state. So what we need to do is give the assurance to the public that they can, you know, keep on protesting as long as it is done in a lawful and orderly manner. If a large number of people is assembled, well then police permission would have to be granted if they're going to process. But nothing is wrong with assembling. We are guaranteed freedom of assembly. The three of us can go to the, the square of the revolution and assemble. It's free. So Guyanese need to be reminded that the government cannot take away their fundamental rights. And what we saw in Linden on the 18th of July 2012 was that the most vital funda funda uh, human right, the right to life, has been taken away. And what has been paid there you know, is, is really a pittance you know, in terms of um, the compensation to sustain the families. Opposition cries and opposition pleading did not stop it from happening in December 2011. It didn't stop it from happening in, in, in Linden, and it didn't stop it from happening recently at Maroudi. What's to assure the public that it wouldn't happen again and possibly in a worse fashion? Well, look, let's go back um, to your previous question. Um, because the protest started in April. In fact, it started a few days after Dr. Ashni Singh, the Minister of Finance, announced the budget and he made it clear that he intended to uh, increase the electricity tariffs and we were all opposed to that and uh, the women of Linden and the ordinary Lindeners started their protests from April. Those protests went through May, June and APNU regarded the protest as a citizen's protest. It did not get involved, it did not try to hijack the process. It allowed the citizens to protest. And I personally went to Linden and I joined the protest outside of the office of the president, 
calling for the president to sit down and speak with the Regional Democratic Council, which represented the people of uh, Region 10, to desist from threatening to impose the rates, to introduce an economic uh, recovery program, and to give the people of the region the other benefits that they were calling for, for example, the removal of the dust nuisance, the television, and so on. So these matters were notified to the government of Guyana before the 18th of July. Now, when you look at other protests, what we see happening, a place like Maroudi or elsewhere, um, well, it happened in December 2011 after the elections, the government must change its attitude. It is behaving in, a two, in too authoritarian and dictatorial a manner. And they must sit down and listen to um, protesters and ensure that those protests are, are dealt with in a lawful uh, manner. And this has not been happening on the People's Progressive Party Civic. They made a terrible mistake in Linden and uh, people were killed and we all suffer as a result of that. All President Ramatar had to do was sit down and speak to the Lindeners when the crisis arose in April or even in May or even in June. But he waited, waited, waited until his policemen got out of hand and killed people and then we ended up having to do damage control. So my message to the People's Progressive Party Civic Administration is to change the, the attitude to these communities, sit down and speak with the community leaders, and here we had a, uh, a functioning regional administration, and try to resolve the problem before they degenerate into catastrophes. Thank you, sir. In the final few moments of um, this program, uh, of course, it's public knowledge, it's world knowledge that the Venezuelan uh, president, Mr. Hugo Chavez, would have recently passed on. I'd like to give you, and as a leader, as a leader yourself, I'd like to give you an opportunity to probably speak, like I said, in the last few moments about Mr. Chavez and what really the world would have lost. Well, I don't know what the world lost. Um, certainly, uh, President Hugo Chavez Frias was uh, good for the poor people of Venezuela. I think in terms of the history of Venezuelan politics, he was uh, a visionary, you might even say he was a revolutionary. He was a democratically elected leader and he used the uh, financial assets and the resources of his country to improve the quality of life of the ordinary Venezuelans, particularly the poor Venezuelans. He reduced illiteracy, he reduced poverty, um, and I think that he was able to bring uh, the good life that we promise in Guyana to a greater number of Venezuelans. He had an impact on the Caribbean and also on the, in the um, in Latin America by establishing what is called Al ALBA. He's committed to this Bolivarian view of, uh, of uh, hemispheric uh, transformation and he established what is called a petro Caribe, in which the states of the Caribbean had uh, access to more liberal supplies of uh, and financing of uh, petroleum. So I would say that um, in, in terms of Venezuela, he was a hero to the Venezuelan masses, and he did improve their condition of life. Thank you very much. Brigadier the Honorable David Granger, Opposition Leader and Leader of the People's National Congress Reform. This has been another program of the public interest. Thank you very much for joining us. I am Malika Ramsey. Goodbye.